Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends from the media, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this conference on need for reform in political parties for effective governance organized by Tulukuma Foundation. This is a part of the Strategic Insights Seminar Series 2021. I'm Soham Das, Director of Tulukuma Foundation. Tulukuma Foundation works globally in the areas of international relations, financial, environmental, scientific, strategic, and defense policy. Warm greetings of the 71st Republic Day of India to all of you. On this important day, we are really happy to organize this conference on need for reform in political parties for effective governance with eminent experts. We are honored to have among us Dr. S.Y. Qureshi, former Chief Election Commissioner of India, to deliver the keynote address at this conference. Dr. Qureshi is the author of the book, An Undocumented Wonder, The Making of the Great Indian Election. The other distinguished speakers are Professor Shomita Sen, Vera Harmsworth, Professor of Imperial and Naval History, University of Cambridge, former Vice Chancellor, Diamond Harbor Women's University. Professor Balveer Arora, former Rector and Pro-Vice Chancellor, JNU, Professor Emeritus and Chairman, Center for Multilevel Federalism, Institute of Social Sciences. He was conferred the title of Knight in the Order of the Legend of Honor by the President of France in 2011. Dr. Kalanidhi Viraswamy, Honorable Member of Lok Sabha from Chennai North. Mr. Jitendra Kumar Oja, former Joint Secretary, Government of India, and Visiting Distinguished Fellow and Head of National Security and Strategic Studies Division, Tilosuma Foundation. He is a noted geopolitical and national security analyst. Thank you for being with us at this discussion. As we know that political parties in India are very crucial parts of the Indian polity. There are around 2,600 political parties in India. Governments at the central and the state levels are basically formed by the political parties. Therefore, political parties play a significant role in determining government policy, including in very important areas like foreign policy or national security strategy. As India becomes a global power, the role of political parties in nation building and policy making needs to be reanalyzed. The political parties also have a crucial role in upholding the pluralistic democratic culture in India. The Constitution of India does not specifically mention any rules or recommendations about political parties, but there are several conventions and structures that have developed over the years, including some important statutes like the Part 4A of the Representation of the People's Act 1961. The Election Commission of India, a constitutional body, as under Article 324 of the Indian Constitution, formulates guidelines from time to time for political parties. As per Election Commission of India guidelines, the political parties of India are classified as national parties or state parties. I think this conference is an excellent opportunity to discuss and debate the various structural and functional reforms that may be incorporated in political parties of India to make policymaking and governance more efficient and effective. Let me now request Mr. Jitendra Kumar Oja, Distinguished Fellow to the Foundation, who has researched and written extensively on this subject to take the conference forward. Thank you very much, Soham. It is indeed a delight and honor to be with so many distinguished speakers and experts. First of all, warmest greetings of our Republic Day. We have come a long way from those days, from earlier days, when people were dismissing us. They were very skeptical about India's ability to survive even as a united country. But we are the biggest republic in entire human history and this is certainly a day of great pride. Our political class has made a significant contribution. It is their vision, it is their stewardship, which has helped us progress. And of course, whatever India has achieved, these progresses have inspired us to think big. Soham has laid down the foundation, what we are going to discuss uh, in this uh, seminar. I am particularly honored to be amidst so many distinguished uh, person, especially Dr. Qureshi. I've had the privilege to listen to his lectures when I was a very young officer. Uh, Professor Balbir Aroda, he was my teacher more than th three decades back at Jawaharlal Nehru University. In his presence, I continue to feel as if I'm again, once again, a student. And Dr. Sub uh, Professor Samita Sen, she is a fellow president, and what an honor to meet her here. And Dr. Kalanidhi, he has been very gracious and kind. We wrote to nearly 40 to 42 political parties but uh, most of them, they cited one or the other reason. Some said uh, West Bengal elections are around the corner. This is a Kolkata body, and we don't want to commit any mistakes. We have to take uh, clearance from our party leadership, and somehow they have managed to stay away. Everybody, I am not a writer on political parties. My core area is national security strategy. And I feel 
that uh, there's very little awareness about national security strategy. When we talk about it, national security is not only military security or conflict management, it is way beyond that. I wouldn't talk to get into that. Two or three points I would mention. We are living in a very difficult geopolitics. We have two nuclear armed hostile neighbors around us and it becomes extremely crucial that we are able to marshal all our governance institutions. We are able to stay as a very cohesive nation and at the same time, continuously empower ourselves. It is widely acknowledged in the strategic community globally that a secular, plural, democratic, vibrant India is critical not only for 1.3 billion Indians, but it is critical for larger peace and stability in this region and beyond. In the last uh, three to four decades, we have constantly been talking how a, an authoritarian country like China, which is uh, expected to rely more on loyalty and coercion an opaque society has managed to forge ahead. Of course, uh, our democracy has its strengths, but uh, there has also been perception that this democracy in this form has evolved in different contexts and felt needs to different people. We are really grateful that our uh, founder, founding fathers of the constitution, they were visionary. They did not do a cut and paste job. They brought the best features from everywhere and politicians held us together. But at the same time, this kind of anomaly has to be addressed. So as intellectuals, as people who have dealt with this subject, Dr. Qureshi, Professor Balbiru in his own way, and uh, Professor Sain, uh, Dr. Kalanidhi, all these people, we would like that we should agitate on these issues. What is it which is ailing political party system in India? How can we have the most skilled people in political parties? What are obstructions in this regard? How can we move forward? So on these notes, may I invite Dr. S.Y. Qureshi to deliver his keynote address. Dr. Qureshi, please, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roja. Um, I th thought there's a, a, a webinar or a conference on political parties was long overdue. Uh, this is one subject we hardly ever talk about, although they're most crucial to democracy. And uh, the uh, Mitra Oja and the, the opening speaker spelled out the importance of the subject, no doubt, that political parties are extremely critical for democracy. Uh, without them, uh, we can't have elections, we cannot have democracy. And uh, uh, it was mentioned that the constitution uh, the longest constitution uh, in the world, it did not say a word about it when it was promulgated. Then um, uh, whether uh, about the uh, formation of parties, organization or functioning. But at the same time, this was not unprecedented because um, most democracies in the world did not have uh, anything uh, on uh, political parties, except Germany, where uh, the constitution tried to protect uh, the, uh, the rights of the political party. Later on, uh, Spain, Portugal, and uh, Canada, those constitutions uh, talked about regulation of the political parties. Now, Election Commission uh, has been uh, playing a um, on and off kind of a role uh, from the beginning, from, from the first general election of 1951-52. Um, it recognized uh, 14 parties as uh, multi-state parties and 59 as a state party. And uh, later on, the, one of the most significant uh, orders of uh, the Election Commission of India was election symbols, reservation and allotment order in 1968, uh, uh, where it used its power under the conduct of uh, election rules 1961. And... Uh, the, the rules it laid down actually amounted to legislation and it was a challenge uh, as illegal and ultra-virus, but the Supreme Court held uh, the uh, this order uh, very valid and uh, that indirectly gave uh, power of almost um, uh, legislation, if not uh, uh, subordinate legislation, let us say, to the Election Commission of India. Well, in 1978, Supreme Court in a very famous case, Mahindra Singh Gill versus Election of India, uh, mentioned comprehensive responsibilities for free and uh, fair election of uh, the Election Commission of India. Uh, in other words, uh, the uh, residuary powers, whatever was not mentioned anywhere, 
those powers were uh, the, given to the election commission uh, through this judgment later on in 1996 um, in, in another uh, case in the supreme court bhim singh versus election commission of india uh, the uh, order said the judgment said that ec has to ensure proper conducive atmosphere for free and fair election uh, and uh, um, i'll quote the exact word it can exercise any power um, even if the conduct of election rules and the act and the rules there and that do not confer any such power specifically <coughs> excuse me um so you know um, this uh, omnibus power uh, given by the uh, supreme court uh, election commission has used um, uh, quite effectively then uh, another thing which um, cropped up was in 1985 an anti defection amendment to the constitution uh, um, where political parties were formally recognized as part of parla parliamentary process later on in 1989 uh, representation of people act uh, was amended with the addition of sec section 29a giving authority to the election Commit commission to register political party and uh, uh, it was mentioned that the the bylaws and the party constitution will uh, have to specifically um, express allegiance to the constitution and interestingly Uh, it said that uphold the principles of sec socialism secularism and democracy and unity of integrity of india that the constitution of a political party has to have these words that we will uphold the principles of socialism secularism and democracy and uh, of course unity and integrity of india how many of our political parties are in violation of this is for all of us to see then uh, election commission also introduced the concept of recognition of political party this is a highly misunderstood term we uh, people confuse between uh, registration and recognition register any uh, group of people can register a political party and there are uh, 2600 uh, last count that was yesterday today it may have gone up uh, by a couple of dozen now um, but the recognition is based on political electoral performance of political party there are only six nationally recognized political party and about 45 46 and it, the number keeps on uh, going up down it is form it's uh, b um, the basic thing is that they should get 6% of the votes and uh, how many mla how many mp then how, uh, how many is there is a detailed uh, metric so on which uh, recognition or de recognition uh, has been done by the election commission then uh, um, uh, many times the issue has been raised that some parties are non functional some parties are uh, only uh, interested in fund collection why should they not be de registered why is the election commission too toothless why is it not taking any action they don't realize that we do not have the election commission does not have the power to de register the case as they had gone up to supreme court and in 2002 the case was in indian national congress versus institute of social welfare uh, in which the supreme court said that uh, the power to de register has to be specifically given and uh, not uh, presumed just because you have the power to register you have power to de register that is not correct it has to be given specifically until today the political parties have not considered it necessary to give this power because they are happy uh, if the election commission uh, is toothless to that extent you know the, there is no internal democracy in fact uh, mr jagdeep chokar of adr said that the election in uh, various parties are sham election and uh, dynastic uh, rule in every political uh, almost every political party seems to be the uh, norm then um, in 1994 justice we have ir krishna ir committee um, called for for a law to ensure inter party democracy inner party democracy and uh, financial transparency and uh, subsequently 170th report of the law commission 
also uh, suggested that there should be reform of electoral laws where political parties, and it said that political parties can be dictatorships internally and uh, democratic in its functioning outside, which of course uh, is true because that's what we see all the time. Then uh, in 2002, National Committee to review the working of the constitution. It recognized the need for regulation of party funds. Uh, and it uh, said that they should be uh, independent of these funds. And uh, it noted that there is increasing casteism and communalism in elections. And uh, it uh, called for a strengthening of uh, anti defection law. And uh, uh, importantly, it said that there is need for restoration of moral authority in public life. Now, Later on in 2006, ADR went to Chief Information Commissioner asking for um, uh, the um, income tax returns of these political parties to be made public uh, as the political parties were public authorities. Uh, yeah, this uh, debate uh, continued in 2013. The CIC de uh, determined that six national parties are uh, to be uh, regarded as um, public authority and they have to declare. But all parties got united and uh, nothing has come of it and uh, uh, the, with the result we have no transparency. Now two major issues, uh, uh, which is my last point, uh, are uh, most relevant and they are debated, but, though not di directly in the context of political party. One is the uh, political finance, and um, because everybody talks of money, role of money in election, corruption in election, uh, corruption in collection of money, corruption in the spending of money, and um, uh, there is a demand for political uh, finance uh, transparency. And this has been going on for almost 30 years. Uh, 1990, then Dinesh Goswami Committee recommended limited funding, uh, limited public funding of political parties. 1998, in the Jit Gupta Committee, uh, said the same, but uh, he made it conditional on uh, inner party democracy. Since that has not happened, there has been no uh, limited or full state funding of political party. Um, Later on, uh, three years ago, electoral bonds were introduced. Now, interestingly, in his, uh, they were introduced through the budget. And in, uh, interestingly, when the finance minister was re reading his budget speech, he made two very good statements, which were music to my ears. He said that uh, without transparency of political funding, free and fair elections are not possible. And then he said that for 70 years, we have failed to achieve that. So one expected that the, what he's going to do through the budget is to include, uh, introduce transparency. Instead, he introduced um, electoral bonds. Now, um, why it is a far thing being a reform, it is a deform that whatever transparency existed has been taken away. At that time, any donation of more than 20,000 was brought to the notice of uh, the election commission. It was reported to the election commission. Any donor of 20,000 or more. Now 20 crores or 200 crores, who donated to whom? Nobody knows. Now this secrecy and the, it was said that because that the donor wants secrecy. Now donor may want secrecy, but public wants transparency. And public's uh, desire uh, should be made. And now, why does donor want say, secrecy? Because they want to hide quid pro quo. There is no free lunch. If I give you 20 crores, 20 crores, I want something in return. Maybe a license, maybe uh, a bank loan with which I'll run away. So, um, um, which, which is what they want to hide and which is what the uh, public wants to prevent. So, uh, it has gone to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court has found no time for this important uh, issue, which is a pity um, uh, in itself. So, no, no, my own formulation is that the uh, state funding of elections uh, is not desirable because, you know, we give uh, 70 lakhs for a Lok Sabha candidate and every candidate gets it. And, uh, so some non-serious candidates will crop up. They'll uh, spend five crore, five lakhs and his uh, pocket 75 lakhs. 
and uh, there is no accounting i have uh, instead suggested there should be funding of political parties not of candidates but political parties based on their actual performance in the election and my uh, uh, broad formulation is that for every vote that a candidate or a political party get we give them 100 rupees in the last general election uh, 60 crores uh, crore votes were at 100 rupees it makes it 6000 crores so let us give 6000 crores to political parties by check they don't have to resort to illegitimate means extortion uh, corruption bribe uh, with they can get all this money with uh, up front by check uh, with dignity the question is whether 6000 crores will be enough sure enough it will be enough because the collection of all the political parties during the last 5 years is less than that so with all the fair and foul means if they are not able to raise more than 5000 5500 crores and here they get 6000 crores with dignity by check i think this is a measure they should adopt they should accept i've been talking about it for 7 years but there is no taker no no one no political party has considered it i don't know why because uh, why does confusion help them now second issue the one is financial uh, transparency yeah there is criminalization of politics we have seen the people with criminal cases uh, in uh, parliament and vidhan sabha it is increasing uh, by the year in 2004 um, parliament there were 124 mp against whom there were criminal cases and many of the, the multiple cases and serious cases he was suspended it went up to from 124 to 167 in 2009 to 182 in uh, 2000 and uh, uh, which was that uh, 14 election and uh, in the latest election 233 the way this number is going up and up and up uh, uh, it's it's a shame about 30 35% of all legislators in parliament or vidhan sabha have criminal cases and many of them uh, criminal cases uh, either case we have been demanding that the uh, cases again if there are some serious cases against some people they should be debarred from contesting election the answer given to us is that the, the um, a maxim of law that uh, uh, we are presumed innocent till proved guilty so unless they are convicted um uh, they are innocent i have a counter question which i have asked in many fora uh, where uh, judges were present jurists were present and i have not got my answer i'll uh, repeat that uh, question to to you ladies and gentlemen my question is that in indian jails today we have 4 lakh prisoners today of which 70% are under trial that means not yet convicted therefore innocent presumed innocent yet of these innocent people we have taken away four fundamental rights the right to liberty the uh, freedom of movement freedom of occupation right to dignity now we have taken away the four fundamental right uh, besides the right to vote which is not a fundamental right but four fundamental rights and a right to vote has been taken away now right to contest election is not a fundamental right if it is suspended during pendency of this within the ambit of law now we have taken away these fundamental rights of these under trial within the ambit of our law which uh, talks of presumption of innocence so now um, uh, why can't we have uh, within this uh, ambit of the same law uh, this provision that these guys cannot contest till they are um, uh, absolved or convicted uh, either way now that this is what is uh, pending now um, uh, the matter went up to supreme court in 2018 a five judge bench and they said that uh, look so it is not um, uh, for supreme court uh, actually there should be a law parliament is obliged to pass a law under the constitution article 102 uh, which they have none in 70 years and uh, therefore it is very unlikely that they will do it uh, uh, in the coming days so um, now well uh, legislation is not done because of a lack of consensus in political parties but my question is what stops political parties from giving uh, tickets only to those against whom there are no keen candidate against uh, who are not tainted what is stopping them 
In fact, one uh, leader of a state party, the, some years ago, said among the, the uh, BSP in um, UP, uh, the leader said that she will give uh, no ticket to those who are against there are criminal cases. We were very happy. That was uh, a good statement, but it didn't happen. Well, I think Mr. Modi also had said that such people should not be given a uh, ticket, but it has not happened. Now, uh, uh, some reforms which have to come through parliament or the ju ju judiciary, but what about uh, reform within, uh, voluntary reform? So, um, I uh, think uh, reform of political parties is a good subject which you have taken up. This needs to be uh, escalated. This needs to be the uh, voiced over and over and again till we uh, see some uh, some kind of reform happening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Qureshi. Sir, you have given a most credible perspective on this issue and it couldn't have come from a better person. And our concern from national security point of view, you have highlighted very well this uh, criminalization and uh, caste issues, I feel that a country which cannot stay cohesive internally makes itself vulnerable. So whatever may be the past or history, we have to stay cohesive and uh, political parties or no one has any business to fracture national cohesion of India. Secondly, you also talked about financial issues and this highlights that if there are uh, unreasonable or uh, such inimical forces who get into this space, we know counterfeiting of currency is a uh, uh, reality. So how dangerous it makes uh, for our political system, how our political class or decision making process can be vulnerable. And you've also highlighted criminalization. And uh, I'm sure that we have only one representative from political class. Our concern is not against politicians. Our worry is what happens if criminals start replacing politicians, they start easing them out from political space. With these words, may I now invite uh, Professor Balbir Arora. He is an institution as far well as study of federalism in this country is concerned, nearly five decades, four or five decades or so. And we have always been eager to listen to him. Sir, may I request you to please speak? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Jitendra. And uh, I, I think after um, Dr. Qureshi's uh, background, which has given uh, us a very comprehensive a uh, view of uh, uh, what ails uh, political parties, the various suggestions that have been made from time to time, the call for self-discipline, and the question of whether you can have a democracy function with parties which are undemocratic in their own function. I think that is the larger issue. Can you have uh, uh, a flourishing democracy. Now, one uh, remark at the outset, uh, and that would give me the cue for what I intend to say today, is that the title says need for reform in political parties for better governance. I would suggest inserting the word better democratic governance. Because I think what we are trying to do is to improve the quality of our democracy. The sum and substance of what Dr. Qureshi said was, how can we be um, a good free and fair election democracy if politicians are tainted, the electoral process is tainted, and they are not willing to reform, the Supreme Court washes its hands off. So, let me uh, um, lay before you a few points where I'll try to show two things. One is that the concept of free and fair elections has evolved and it needs to be reviewed constantly. What were free and fair elections uh, in the 70s and the 80s, today the challenges for conducting free and fair elections. And I think this is the, um, the election commission is seized of it, but it needs to be empowered to uh, act on it. Uh, that is the first thing. The second thing that I would like to talk about 
is the importance of counterpowers. Now, what do I mean by counterpowers? Counterpowers uh, is an extension of the system of checks and balances where they exist in addition to the uh, traditional checks and balances between the different state organs and they are intended to act as you may call it um, uh, throwing light on or uh, making public authority, public powers accountable. I'll give you one example. I think the RTI is a very good example of a counter power, the power in the hands of citizens to expose abuse of power by the authorities. There is a law that France is debating which debars citizens from taking videos of police officers performing their duties. Now, you can understand why. Is that abuse of police, uh, of, uh, police authority by, uh, I mean, uh, by, of authority by police officers, every person now has the uh, possibility of filming and then producing before the courts. So the, this counter power is the second thing that I would like to uh, dwell on. Now, the word, the term reform is a very nebulous concept because unless we uh, are clear about who gains from the reform and who loses, you don't really get an idea of what you are talking about. Electoral reforms, uh, uh, Dr. Qureshi mentioned very clearly, in 75, when the, the, the traditional uh, three enemies of free and fair elections were money power, muscle power, and ministerial power, the three M's. And Mrs. Gandhi's uh, election was set aside because the district authorities, um, presumably um, guided by security directives, helped in the construction of the rostrum of one of our meetings. Now, if we look today at the way in which electoral uh, campaigns are conducted and, and the values that have changed the, uh, the whole definition of corrupt practices becomes even more nebulous, even more hazy. And I think we need to uh, uh, revisit that area. The other point that I uh, wanted to emphasize was the notion of shifting arenas of opposition. And when we are talking of political parties, we are talking, I mean, if we, if we go beyond the elections, the uh, way in which they conduct themselves in democratic contests. Dr. Qureshi referred to the electoral bonds and uh, rightly uh, mentioned um, Arun Jaitley's speech. And then you have a, a system where some have called them post-electoral bonds because they are reversing very often the electoral uh, verdict. Uh, and and the, here I'm referring to uh, the uh, ineffectiveness and the need to revisit the Anti-Defection Act. Uh, the, as you know, the, the electoral bonds at this time, they're, they're open for subscription every quarter and then for a month, uh, at the time of the elections. Now, this whole system of funding, where does it leave the election commission in terms of being able to control uh, the amount of money being spent by political parties 
Of course, during elections, there are observers. But in between elections, if this money is used, for example, to, as I said, reverse the verdict of an election by engineering mass defections, uh, I think it goes totally against the purpose for which it was intended. Sites of contestation, shifting sites of contestation, uh, and the, the whole concept, I mean, uh, to give you an example, today, Republic Day, there were two parades. And it was very interesting to see uh, the reporting on the official parade and the plethora of what are called OTT over the top uh, news uh, media channels, whether on Facebook or um, directly reporting on the other parade. Now, sites of contestation and the fact that you have uh, now uh, the proposal for a reform. And that's why uh, I said you have to be very careful about the use of the term reform. We are celebrating 30 years of economic reform. If you see the balance sheet, Oxfam has published a recent report. Thomas Piketty shows that inequality has increased over the last 30 years, the three decades of this reform. So what we are looking at is the, uh, I was referring to the OTTs. The OTTs are uh, being brought, sought to be brought uh, into the net of regulation. This uh, whole idea that uh, what uh, is being said about the political system, how it is being portrayed, how the political class is portrayed must be kept within bounds and within checks. There, there, there is this uh, uh, recent controversy over some films which, and but this is not new. I, I remember the film uh, called Andhi, where I think Mrs. Gandhi was lampooned for her um, uh, authoritarian tendencies. Today, every age has the same instincts, every generation, when it sees injustice, when it sees um, this kind of behavior, wants to uh, shine a spotlight on it. But, and every regime tries to curb this freedom. I'm not saying it is new. What I'm saying is, that in this day and age, this freedom has become so powerful, I'm not just talking about social media and the power to mobilize, because political parties need to mobilize. What I'm trying to get at is that the ecosystem in which political parties operate has changed almost beyond recognition. The traditional mobilization forms of rallies and um, uh, jaloos and, and uh, 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 the uh, traditional uh, canvassing, of course, has its place, it still happens. But there are other ways in which uh, mobilization is taking place. And I think the farmers rally is one a striking example of how uh, you can bring together a mass of people from as far down south as Maharashtra, 
uh, and I think there are parallel rallies being held today. I know in Bangalore, and I don't know about Tamil Nadu. Now, in this system, how do we ensure democratic functioning? That is the point in the sense that we are working with rules and laws that were framed in a certain context. And this need for, uh, I give you another example, because I think that's the best way I can um, uh, bring to life what I'm trying to uh, spell out before you, which is that the ecosystem of political parties having, having changed, the ways of corruption have changed. Corrupt practices is a totally different ball game to what it was in the 70s and 80s. I mean, Bofors, what was it, 64 thousand crores? No, 64 crores. I'm forgetting now how much it was. It was some ridiculous amount. This, uh, and this is the last point that I would mention, is that uh, with the social media, civil society organizations. Civil society organizations are increasingly under pressure. Increasingly under pressure, of course, those that are uh, receiving funding from um, uh, foreign currency are under the FCRA rules and those rules have been tightened and they are being um, uh, uh, some of many of the um, uh, FCRA beneficiary organizations uh, have not seen their licenses renewed. There is also parallel uh, a move towards regulating uh, all c uh, civil society organizations which are benefiting from CSR donations. Now, this, uh, uh, this ecosystem in which parties operate, because they are also helped by their own extension uh, organizations, by their, their own uh, field organizations, which they uh, uh, benefit from because they receive support from them. They uh, traditionally um, uh, recruitment uh, renewal uh, also comes uh, through the channels in the universities, students unions, and so on. This ecosystem I would submit, and this would be my last point, is that the democratic imperative, as far as making uh, political parties democratically uh, uh, instruments of better governance. There are two broad thrusts. One is the, the area which we have discussed is to making the parties more democratic, making sure that their office bearers are elected, their constitutions are deposited with the electoral commission and the, uh, the, uh, all that is, but you, but you can't, really prevent who they elect uh, as their uh, leaders. That is entirely their prerogative. And so there's no point discussing uh, things like uh, political dynasties or, or uh, um, nepotism or, uh, and so on. The other aspect that I am trying to suggest is important for uh, making party's instrument of democratic functioning is the way in which while in power, and they very often there's a consensus on these matters, curiously, or they may not be on many others, the attempt to control more and more the new um, elements that are emerging, which condition Thinking, speaking, mobilization, and therefore thinking which is not 
the same as that of the political party is ipso facto by definition dangerous and to be kept tabs on to be controlled to be checked so we we have to look at political parties not just when they are fighting elections but in between elections they do a lot and what they do uh, we have to uh, evaluate whether it is strengthening democratic uh, governance or whether it is weakening democracy and i think that is the challenge that we face thank you very much thank you so much professor <clears throat> balbir arora for such an insightful perspective in fact when we wanted to have this discussion it is professor arora who suggested that why not start it on 26 january because uh, we believe that democracy and national security of india is something where every citizen is a stakeholder of course we look at this panel as someone who are custodians and guardians of uh, uh, society or their conscience keepers and uh, it should not happen that political class uh, is uh, substituted by a different kind of different shade of people but sir the issues you highlighted we sincerely appreciate we reform is a vague word there is no doubt about it and we assume that democratic governments governance automatically is believed to be a superior form of governance because it is believed in fairness some degree of meritocracy and fair competition but maybe we should have been more specific and the issues you again highlighted i have been reading how from george stigler onwards so they have been saying how western democracy is also it is the corporate class which has been virtually setting its own terms of regulation they have different problems but they are far too advanced they don't share the kind of challenges and vulnerabilities we are facing so in that light your suggestions are deeply appreciated sir we have a sole representative from political class uh, uh, dr kalanidhi I, i would like to invite him so that professor sen can respond and he can say certain things whatever issues that have been raised here and then professor sen will have a chance to respond and of course dr kalanidhi and others can come and uh, share their perspective may i uh, invite dr kalanidhi member of parliament who's the only politician who is present on this panel please dr kalanidhi uh respected uh, former election commission chief uh, dr kureshi and uh, the other the distinguished guests uh, professor balbir arora and uh, professor sumita sen and my good friend mr jitendra jha uh, happy uh, 72nd Indi uh, republic day for you all and uh, i would also like to take this opportunity to commend all the doctors and uh, medical professionals who have worked tirelessly for all the uh, during this pandemic and also for the border security forces the armed forces who have uh, taken care of our borders during this uh, troubled times even a uh, week ago there was uh, some news about that i'm happy to see that and of course uh, mr oja is a geopolitical expert and i am sure he knows about what exactly is happening uh, in these areas um this topic i mean the conference on uh, need for reform in political parties for better governance Uh, the, the moment when uh, i was asked to speak on this i was wondering why i mean like it was surprising that uh, they would call a political person and like uh, rightly mr roja had spoken said that uh, many of the political people who were, were unwilling to participate in this because this has been a kind of a thought which has been going on in my mind and uh, i would say that i mean like one of the biggest reforms which the democracy offers us is that a political party which is not which is resistant to reform is something which is going to be elected out of government and we have seen that happen uh, several times in several states and in the country as well so the democracy of uh, elections and voting by itself is a kind of uh, a, a process by which political parties have to do some i mean like soul searching and look into their policies and ideologies and what i have found uh, which is in our country is that every party we i mean like uh, initially when the when uh, the uh, minister soham das had spoken he said that there are so many parties i mean like there are more than 2000 parties and if you look at all the parties they do not have any clear ideologies i mean like if you look at 
some of Western countries, uh, they take a stand where they say that they are pro-industrialization or they are uh, pro-agriculturists. Uh, and I mean, they have different ideologies. I mean, like liberals or conservatives, and uh, they go by those ideologies. But in India, if you see any political party, they say that they are going to work for all classes of people. So having political parties uh, where there is no class uh, clarity and uh, uh, distinguishing between whom they are going to be supporting and what their kind of policies are going to be uh, creates a lot of confusion among the people. And it's always that we have to rely on the people who are elected to power to do the right thing. And the people sadly have an opportunity only after five years to decide whether this government should continue or not. And uh, the, the other problem is like uh, the presence of these many parties is creating a roadblock because if you look at some of the elections, it is not that the majority of the people have voted a party to power. If you find, I mean, like in several states, you will find that there are about uh, two or three major parties and there are fringe parties where uh, a majority is secured by a person who has secured only 30% of the elected votes. So that by itself is a kind of a very disturbing fact because I feel that uh, probably people should elect the top two parties and probably an election should be conducted again. I'm, sh I'm sure that there are a lot of cost implications in this uh, because we are looking at political parties where they're coming to power based purely on a very, very thin majority. They will take so many political parties which are in existence. And uh, uh, you, we are also talking about how uh, to bring in reforms in political parties for better governance. Uh, I would like to quote one song which is there by one of our famous uh, lyricists. I mean, like he says, like, I, I will say that in Tamil and explain to you what it says. I mean, like a mistake is something you do if you don't know that it is a mistake. But a misdemeanor or uh, a crime is something where the perpetrator knows exactly what he is doing and he is doing it. As long as we have uh, people with, uh, I mean, Mr. Balmi Ravra was is, uh, speaking, he was talking about uh, self-discipline. So I feel that self-discipline is something which uh, has to be instilled in the people where you know, people who come to uh, the political class, they have to be assessed for their uh, self-discipline and the work that they are doing by the people and uh, they should be elected. But it, it, that is not how it happens. I mean, like most often it is a political party which is recognized and their uh, electoral symbol which is recognized that in itself the election commission uh, uh, dr preshi probably can answer about uh, because the moment you be, if you go and ask a voter he will only know the symbol he will not have a clue about who the candidate is or what he has done uh, for the society or for the people over here at large and of course the other thing is another song which says tiranai paathu tirunda vittal tirupai ulikka mudiyadu so unless a criminal, I mean, like if he wants to reform, unless a criminal wants to reform, you cannot stop crimes. So the only way that we have forward is, uh, like I said in my uh, opening uh, um, remark, unless political parties have that kind of a control uh, by the people where if they know that they're going to be voted out if they're not going to perform, then unless that happens it is not possible for any reforms actually to happen and also when dr Kreshi was speaking he was talking about uh, criminal cases against uh, political persons uh, sadly i mean like i'm sure that most of you would agree with me when i say that in india the situation is such that if a political par party is in power you, we know the amount of uh, powers they uh, wield. I mean, like uh, earlier somebody spoke about muscle power, money power, and uh, all these powers, where uh, I have been a plastic surgeon till about uh, three years back. So I have contested in elections and like I have uh, become a representative in the Lok Sabha. And I, don't, I mean, like, and, uh, like uh, uh, Dr. Qureshi had said, uh, uh, Professor Balbir had said, uh, the, the criminal, there are no criminal cases against me so far. But imagine if supposing somebody comes up and uh, has a false case of say a sexual uh, misconduct or even uh, some unrelated, some murder case or something like that, 
the today's political situation and, and I, I i do not know about the judiciary but uh, the judiciary system and the bureaucratic system and the executive system everything is in, in such powers that uh, we have seen these kind of charges being faced by the former uh, supreme court uh, chief justice himself so i don't know if it is true or if it is not but i'm not going into that but i am saying that anything is possible in this country and if you bring in a law which says that only non convicted people should be coming into power i'm sure be it uh, for uh, in my constituency i am working against uh, a corporate uh, huge corporate giant where they are looking at uh, amassing 6000 acres of coastal area for the development of harbor so i have been working against it so it is just going to be a matter of a very simple reason for them to file file the case against me where i can have a criminal case pending against me so i feel that the judiciary at least to for the time being has thought it prudent not to have anybody who is just convicted the mere conviction should not be uh, ruling out the political people out of uh, electoral politics and also the autonomy of our constitutional bodies i mean there must be some way where these uh, um, uh, bodies i mean like the election commission for example uh, and uh, the enforcement directorate all those things should have absolute autonomy where they should not be under any kind of whichever party be it in power it should have a free and fair way of uh, assessing and uh, and dealing with whatever the issues are because the moment there is some kind of an authority over the person who can be elected for that particular post then there is always like a quid pro quo where where we don't know what can go wrong uh, we have seen that even in the us elections where trump was supposed to have appointed the supreme court uh, justice over there where it was leading to a lot of uh, uh, issues and uh, also talking about the anti defection law which uh, dr qureshi has spoken about and i'm sure it is a fantastic law but i feel that uh, we should make sure that this law is in existence only for deciding about which government is formed I mean, which political party forms the government but when it comes to basic uh, bills i mean like when you're talking about certain bills i feel that the elected representatives should be given the choice to vote according to their constituent needs because just by this anti defection law i have seen several parliamentarians voting just because they have a whip who says that you have to vote on this particular issue only on on the i mean like you have to vote only this way is actually uh, uh, i mean like it is a total murder of democracy if i if i can probably say that probably is a bit too harsh but uh, as an elected representative if i, I cannot decide about the farmers law bill for that matter Uh, we had, we had uh, stood against the uh, farms farmers bill and the only thing we wanted was the msp be included in that bill and the government had a brute majority in the uh, lok sabha and they were able to pass it but in the rajya sabha you i'm sure everybody has seen how it was passed in the rajya sabha with in an undemocratic way and if uh, if you i mean like i would also like to say ben franklin in 1787 uh, when they formed their uh, constitution and the people asked him so what kind of a government are you giving us is it a monarchy or a republic he is uh, allegedly has supposed to have said a republic if you can keep it so it is left for the people to make sure that they have a republic where they are able to uh, maintain this uh, uh, democracy and republic and keep it alive and uh, also i would like to say that uh, uh, the russian leader Joseph Stalin's daughter uh, when she had visited India she was asked by the media whether uh, which was the best form of go uh, government according to her was it capitalism or communism or uh, republic and and she said it really does not matter which form of government is the best because if there was a, a very clear idea about which form is the best it would already be in vogue the best form of government depends on the person who is heading that particular party and the person who is sitting on the top and calling all the shots if he is a person who is clean and if he is uh, a democratic person he will run his party in a demo democratic way and he will run the country in a democratic way uh, and i mean and also we need to talk about the journalists there was a talk about uh, journalists we should also have apart from talking about the uh, reform in political parties we should also talk about reform in journalism because we find a lot of uh, 
I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of journalists who are doing a good job. The similar, in the same way as there are plenty of politicians who are doing an excellent job. But uh, there are some uh, black sheep here and there in all forms. I mean, like I, I would say that it is existent wherever, and uh, I feel that. Uh, there should be some accountability for every class, be it the political class, the journalists, or everybody. There should be some kind of uh, accountability which should be uh, made uh, strict and enforceable. So that is one thing uh, which we are lacking. In fact, when uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Balbir Arora had spoken, he was talking about in France the uh, recording of uh, videos is against the law. Uh, I'm sure, sir, uh, you have uh, visited uh, several countries, including France and uh, the rest of Europe. But I have been there and I have seen the amount of police uh, authority they have. I am using authority as in a very, very mild manner because I have seen right outside uh, the uh, Garay du Nord, when I stepped out, there was a black man who looked, I mean, he was a penniless poor person who was begging in the streets. And he was being lucky charged for no reason by a group of about five or six uh, policemen. And even when we were traveling in Europe, uh, most of our friends said that when you are going into France and uh, you kindly ensure that you are very, very polite with the cops because they are very strict over there. So it is a very thin line which says the cops are strict where uh, they have the right to enforce the law. and. Uh, police brutality. It's a very, very thin line, sir. So I feel that uh, the uh, a person's uh, freedom to record what is happening to him is definitely something which a right, I think no government should ever take it away from him. Because I have seen repeatedly time and again in US, I'm sure everybody would agree that the number of instances where the police have uh, acted in excess is uh, so much that but for those video recordings people would have assumed that the uh, person who the victim was probably the moment because the, the, the racial profiling is so huge because the moment you say there is a black person and he was beaten up by the cops immediately everybody thinks that he must have done something wrong but we do not know to what extent these uh, authority are either used or abused so i feel that uh, it is a very very thin line like i said earlier it is left up to a person to be either a good person or a bad person. So it does not really, I mean, like if you are going to say that uh, this party or that party, I'm sure that every party has good people and there are every parties which have like people who have ulterior motives. So it is very difficult to see who is the right person and that is left for the political parties to see by their performance. And we have several yardsticks. I mean, like we have several yardsticks by which these politicians can be assessed in that some of the yardsticks which are being used are archaic nowadays. I mean, like uh, we have a parliament, I mean, like uh, we have an organization which defines uh, uh, the performance of a parliamentarian by his attendance, by the number of debates he participates in, and the number of questions he asks, which I feel are like uh, kind of not really up to the mark. I feel that there should be better way of assessing a uh, political person's performance, like what he is doing with his constitution, I mean, constituency funds, and what development has he brought inside his constituency and what changes has he made to the people in his constituency or in the state so with i mean like i i'm sure that there are a lot more uh, people who probably would agree or disagree with me and uh, we i'm sure we're going to have a very interesting debate uh, probably post everybody's speech uh, and uh, with this i would like to thank everybody the tilotama foundation for giving me this opportunity to participate thank you very much Thank you so much, Dr. Kalanidhi. We sincerely admire that you are only senior political leader who has decided to join this conference and your perspective is valuable. You represent voice of sanity from the realm of politics. So we sincerely appreciate that. And this gives us an idea and uh, sentence our belief that India has to spearhead some major innovations in democracy. I also take this opportunity. Now, may I invite Professor Samita Sen to make her observations? Please, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, let me say, uh, to start with, how um, um, pleased I am to be with you today uh, on Republic Day from far away. It is really uh, very uh, nice for me to think that I'm in virtually in Kolkata, which is where my hometown. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me. 
Um, and um, um, to uh, Mr. Qureshi, uh, to Professor Arora, to um, uh, Dr. Veeraswamy, uh, my greetings. Um, to Jitendra Ojha and to Soham Das for inviting me, many thanks. Uh, let me say that I am a professor, it is true, but my um, academic work has very little to do with post-independent political parties. So I'm speaking as a reasonably educated citizen uh, rather than as an academic today. Um, and I will say, um, I will flag very quickly four issues which I think uh, uh, are important for us going forward, but also in response to some of the things my previous speakers have said. Um, I will start by saying that this is an extraordinary moment, uh, not only in the history of India, but in world history. Um, and we have a very new crisis uh, in democracy that is not just Indian. Uh, it is a much wider um, global issue. And uh, we have watched the last two, three weeks, a drama unfold in the world's oldest modern democracy, very large also, not the largest perhaps, um, but an important country. Um, and it has flagged for us some of the issues that now run across many countries, including those which we have been brought up to think to be advanced democracies, uh, in which democracy itself should at least not be uh, in discussion or question. Uh, now the this moment then, and every moment of crisis is always also a, a moment of opportunity. Uh, so how the global community and how each of us in our countries will re-envisage -env democracy and re-envisage the, the way forward um, uh, is, 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 is up to discussion. Um, and I will um, echo what Professor Arora said, reform is a very complicated term, but on the other hand, crisis is also a time when imaginations of reform are um, open. Um, and that is a good time in which to think about how we wish to change. I will also um, um, reiterate what uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Veeraswamy said. Uh, that reform and evolution is necessary to every political formation, is essential to every political formation, not only parties, but including parties. Um, so with these uh, preliminary words, let me jump into one very uh, 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 complicated question that has troubled Indian uh, politics which uh, many of my previous speakers have referred to in passing. Um, uh, we speak about caste um, and caste and politics a great deal. And one of the um, changes in the 1980s was the growth of political parties with very um, uh, uh, specific caste uh, identities or affiliations. And um, uh, this has been seen as a relationship between identity politics and democratic politics. Um, and we have discussed around the issue in many ways. Um, but I will say two things. One is that caste is not the only element of identity politics in our polity. Um, so now we see a great deal of escalation in community as an element of identity in politics. And we have perhaps forgotten, but in the last decade, gender had emerged as a major identity politics. Um, and the gender had also emerged in two different um, registers. One was the whole question of the third gender. And that had a relatively easier resolution, though we maybe it did not register in terms of numbers, 
But at least in terms of principle, we were able to accept non-binary people within mainstream political systems. Uh, we tend not to talk about it, but it was in fact when a, a situation in which our polity was far ahead of our society. It was quite a revolutionary um, 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 moment for, uh, not revolutionary perhaps, but a very progressive moment that we should embrace. In contrast to that, the women's reservation question suffered very badly. Um, it got the um, local, it cleared the 73rd, 74th, the, the local self-government um, uh, cleared the decks, but the uh, bigger question of assemblies and parliaments uh, is still pending. Uh, so there has been, you know, many kinds of identity politics in a uh, uh, conversation in our political system. And the interesting thing about the women's reservation question was that two, two ideas. So, uh, so what happened is that caste particularly, but also in a um, relatively minor way um, community, um, and gender became confrontational identities in determining the question of reservation. Now, how do we take this? How do we take this play of identity in mainstream political formations and in the, 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 the operation of political parties? I would say two things. I would say that we, the pro, in the process of since today's Republic Day, one of the changes our constitution made. Our, our constitution did not outlaw caste. We did not abolish caste, but we did abolish inequality. Caste is fundamentally a social relation of inequality. So we have created a slightly anomalous situation where we have kept caste, but we have said that it must not be unequal. It must not the inequality of caste should be removed. Now, this is obviously a prescription to, so we are setting ourselves a social goal, a political goal. And it is only through the political process that that goal will be realized. So it is almost impossible to say that Indian democracy will not involve caste. It has to involve caste. The process of the, the, the translation of political democracy into social equality has to involve social relations of inequality. It is through the mainstream political process that we will have to and must address questions of inequality. So in a sense, I see nothing negative in it. Every social axis of inequality must, in my view, come into our political process. Um, and the, the, the introduction of caste into our political process cannot be wholly reserved, uh, reversed. There may be accommodation, negotiations and changes, but as long as caste as inequality remains, caste will be grist to the political mill. Second, these relationships, if we take these social relationships, say of gender and caste, what do they feed into? Which social institution is structured by gender and caste? Family, after all. And family remains a very important social institution in India. Now, is it surprising then that family is also part of how our politics works? And I'm talking about the way we talk about dynastic politics. Dynasty is not restricted to politics. In India, everything is dynastic. Our film actors are inherit their father's profession. Our doctors, our lawyers, our public servants, I can't think of a single profession in which there isn't inheritance. Sons take their father's uh, 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 occupations. Um, 
the daughters also sometimes um, and it is it is after all also it is this inheritance of occupation that is the very definition of caste so you may modernize that caste relationship into a different way in which occupation is inherited but in a sense those are the coordinates which make up um, this political formation so social relations and political formations cannot be thought of we cannot think in terms of um, desirable political goals without taking into account social realities that is the, the the basic point i'm trying to make and some of the demands we make of the political system are of by standards of advanced western countries uh, which are not compatible with our social realities often so i come then to the third uh, my third point which is that if we say that political parties should not be dynastic they should not be this they should not be caste based they should not be this that then how should they be um and the question that has often been um, the debate that has often been around this is uh, not very clearly articulated but a question of professionalization of politics do we want professional politicians politicians who have been trained a technocratic solution or a managerial solution that you actually have people who are trained who become then um, professional politics now i don't have an answer to this question except that i have a distrust of professionalization of anything or managerialization of anything um but um I would say that we have seen a slightly different version of this in the last decade or so, um, uh, the PK phenomena. Uh, so you don't actually have professionalization of politics itself or political parties, but you have an outside uh, uh, entity, a professional entity, which is providing technocratic solutions for political parties. Now, how far this has worked, what its implications are, I would actually invite other uh, more experienced people in the panel uh, to comment on. Uh, so I come from there to more. So if we think in terms of formalization of politics um, and professionalization would be one way of formalizing politics. Then the second issue about formalizing politics has been something all the speakers have touched on, have spoken, uh, uh, Mr. Qureshi has spoken at length on, is the question of financing. And I will just say, uh, uh, because it's already been discussed, I will just say one or two things that I uh, think can be added to the discussion. Um, so. It was, I think, in 2019 that Krishnamurti called for um, a particular kind of state funding of uh, uh, both political parties and elections. And uh, uh, Mr. Qureshi has told us that the, the response to that came in the form of election bonds. Um, and it's perhaps the most worrying development that has taken place in terms of our elections because it has introduced legally. So, so far all the corruption in ele elections that happened was corruption. But now we have a legal opacity of funding in elections, which, you know, we have not been able to um, 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 uh, address in any way, as as uh, Mr. Qureshi pointed out, it's still pending, and we don't know what the future of this um, provision will be, um, how we can deal with this question. Um, and the issue that runs through all these, um, uh, all the points that have so far made, is the question of uh, inner party democracy. And the, the basic question, I think, which uh, I think Professor Arora asked, can you have 
democracy with political parties which are themselves not democratic. Um, and in this context, we have to look at some of the debates which Mr. Viras, Dr. Virasamy has already flagged some of the issues that come along uh, with the anti-defection bill. Um, and I mention anti-defection bill because of the kind of um, a critique that Chandrasekhar uh, Limay had made at the time of the passing of the bill. Uh, they had denounced this bill as an undemocratic bill, as the institutionalization of the illegitimate power of political or party leadership over elected MPs and MLAs. Um, and um, what it rests, what their argument rested on was a very interesting feature, which um, um, I think Mr. Qureshi mentioned, but we should perhaps flag it uh, with more importance, uh, that the Indian constitution, today's Republic Day, the original constitution does not actually have political parties. The constitution does not allow for political parties. So what is const uh, in the in our democratic framework, it is the person who is elected, who is important rather than the political party of which he may or may not be a part. That is an extra constitutional issue rather than a constitutional safeguard. So what we have done with the anti-defection bill is that we have um, placed an extra constitutional authority over the constitutional rights and privileges of the elected member. So when Mr. Vedaswamy says, why can't I vote the way my constitution may want me to vote rather than how my party wants me to vote? Um, he is asking a very important question. And in when, when we translate that in terms of anti-defection law, we can ask the question that it is the prerogative of a party to expel a member from their party. So party is a separate entity. I can have a party or a club or a group or a society and I can expel members from it. That's a separate issue. But you cannot expel members from the house because the house members are elected to the house by the people. So what is this relationship then going to be? Can parties and their un, in their undemocratic way, their party leaderships that do not uh, subscribe to what we consider norms of democracy, what power can they have over people who are actually directly elected by our people? So uh, I'm taking too long, so I will now hurry up. Um, I will say that in this context, the question that ties up all these issues, the issues of party democracy, of uh, funding, um, of the relationship between um, elected members and their political parties, is the question of patronage, which has been underlined re repeatedly by scholars of Indian politics that the political system and whether it is democratic or whether it is, you know, part of it is it's partially democratic, it is still very strongly driven by relations of patronage. And this means that political parties are the conduit or political power is the conduit through which we access the state and the resources of the state. This has led in India to a peculiar situation that A, our political parties don't have constitutional mandate in their existence, but the distinct, but they have actually in their extra constitutional existence become so powerful that the line between state and party has become blurred. And nobody will understand this better than people in West Bengal. 
um, uh, Doipan Bhattacharji spoke of the period in left front government as a party society, a situation in which political parties in fact became social formations. So society, not only state and party became blurred, society and party became blurred. Um, and the dominance of political party in the everyday social life of people gave political parties a heft and an importance that perhaps far outweighed any uh, 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 legitimate way in which political parties should or could or ought um, to hold sway. So this is not just any longer a question of electoral um, machinery. It is a question of um, uh, 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 balancing political parties uh, and I would say to both government and society. In West Bengal, I think party saturation is of an extraordinary degree. You, you, no aspect of people's everyday life is untouched by parties. Your primary, all other social identities are now have become subsumed to political parties. But that apart, if, even if we treat that extreme as an exception in the West Bengal case, I would say that the blur the balance between political party and government and the loss of that balance ha is the most important problem in our polity today. So the reform is not something that is only of political parties. It is also the role political parties play in governance, in, in, um, in, in the polity itself. I think that needs very, very uh, close scrutiny. Um, and we need to address that. Um, um, we need a better understanding of it and, a, um, uh, uh, and, a, and to address it. Uh, so thank you. Thanks, that's all. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sen for joining. And certainly you highlighted some very important points. As a society, we are transitioning. And here the role of leadership becomes very crucial. And I mean not only political leadership, leadership in every sector, and especially this is why we have organized an event like this. And we propose to deal with each and every issue. Professor Arora said, you want to have a discussion in this series, 26 January is the right date. You start from that day. Now I'm very honored to welcome uh, uh, Lord Rami Ranger from London, he is very well known to S.Y. Qureshi and last many, many years, more than a decade, uh, I suppose 13 years or so, I have had the privilege of enjoying his uh, immense goodwill. So at a short notice, I requested him and he has been very kind to join us. Thank you very much, sir. We welcome you. We would like to understand from uh, your point of view, how, is, how are British political parties able to aggregate uh, interests of various sections of society? How much is their role in contribution uh, in governance do you think that they are also facing some challenge? There's need for some evolution in the party structure in uh, that country as well. We have largely borrowed the uh, British parliamentary system, British Westminster model of governance. So you would be very enlightened to hear your words, sir. May I now invite Lord Rami Ranger? Please, sir. Thank you very much, Jitendraji. You know, you are someone I admire. Your passion, your commitment, your love for Mother India is really infatuating. It's really catchy and whoever meet you really admire you because you have the tenacity, you have the courage, you have the conviction to push your ideas across. And this event speaks volumes about your commitment for Mother India. And I'm so delighted to be sharing this platform with someone I look up to, Mr. Qureshi, a great Indian leader, a great uh, civil servant or administrators uh, who has served Mother India with distinction and his popularity is throughout the globe is as great as it probably in India, uh, even maybe more. So it's so good to see Mr. Qureshi on the panel and I, I'm now sharing this panel with such academic people, uh, such learned people, professors and you know all these people you aim to do good for Mother India 
and I'm as a humble man. Uh, you can you probably know my background is very simple. Uh, I believe uh, everything is simple uh, in life when you know how. Uh, driving a car is very difficult when you do not know. Even a cycle is very difficult how to ride it if you don't know. But things become easier when you get to understand the logic behind the system. Uh, we can copy uh, one set of rule of the Great Britain, but we have to copy the entire system of Great Britain if in order for us to have the result, what the Great Britain is, democracy is uh, producing. So for me, I, I will give very simple solution. Uh, you all want to do good for India. And for that reason, I have had discussion with quite a few people, uh, even with Arun Jetli when he was alive. Uh, very sadly, they, nobody put my ideas or my suggestion to practice. Uh, my idea is very simple, that in order to underpin democracy, you need to have law enforcement agencies run by people who are untouchable. They are not worried about where the next meal is going to come or where the children's fee is going to come or the medical, who's going to pay for their father's or mother's medical bill. If you look at a Bobby in uh, United Kingdom, a police officer, we call him Bobby, his house is free, his medical is free, his education is free, he gets a very good salary and he gets a pension. You try to bribe that police officer and you will be arrested as on the spot because he does not have to compromise his principle. Unfortunately, we expect everybody to be Mahatma Gandhi or Mother Teresa in India uh, without realizing that people like Mahatma Gandhi are not born every day and no every ordinary citizen can be like Mahatma Gandhi who will give up everything for a cause. Yes, there are people we can, we are celebrating the uh, 20, uh, 72nd uh, Republic Day of India. And uh, we have seen some ugly scene which has disturbed us, uh, disturbed and uh, uh, that again, to me, that is a government's, uh, go uh, not a good governance to fight with your own people. You had to resolve this matter very quickly before it gets out of hand. And now all the opposition parties are all together and they are fighting against the government for reason better known to them. But that's politics. People undermine other to such head. So coming back to this simple solution, if you pay an income tax officer a adequate remuneration, then he will not compromise of a uh, income tax bill of an industrialist by getting some backhander. So we are in India penny wise pound foolish. We are cutting corners where we should not be cutting corners. We should be making sure the custom officer, the VAT officer, the inlet income tax officer, the police uh, commissioner, police officer, they're all protected and they're all given top training to underpin our democracy. Democracy is not going to be underpinned uh, by a few idealistic uh, leaders who talk the talk, but as, on, underneath there's a corruption. And you know, corruption is a cancer. It can eat the entire country. It can impede the progress of a country. The money which should go to the uh, public services are not being collected from these uh, rich people. Yes, so therefore it is very important that we uh, uh, make sure that our law enforcement agencies are run by those who are educated and adequately trained, they understand, and also they have, they have given proper remuneration so they don't have to compromise their principle. And the second thing, as you know, I'm a single parent child who lost his father due to partition of India. As my father was against the breakup of India, he could foretell the consequences of religious disharmony he warned the then Muslim leader not to cut and run. Uh, sadly, when a, a foreign body is in your country and they encourage people to use religion in the absence of merit to get something for nothing, and the people will take that opportunity. And then the people who fought the struggle for independence together became rival. And, and the rivalry is so bitter that we have fought 
four wars since and our meager resources are now being spent on the arms we don't need or the equipment which is just going to be obsolete in few years time the same money can be invested on uh, uh, on our people and that they will become they will become asset uh, for life for the country and i always say as a businessman my biggest asset are my people my staff money does not make money people make money the biggest strength of a nation is her people and people should be empowered and when you empower people i mean women women empowerment is prerequisite for civil society here is a living example of a woman who lost her ancestor home country and breadwinner became widow at the age of 35 with eight children arrived on a refugee train to patiala where maharaja patiala had opened refugee camp she started her life but she was educated and because she was educated she could get a job in a kindergarten school and brought eight of us through immense difficulty five of her son became commissioned officer in the indian army and she received the proudest indian mother title from tribune newspaper and i am here in the united kingdom because of the values mothers instilled in me uh, because the mothers are the architect of our future generation fathers are always busy trying to run their businesses or jobs or, or if they are in the army they will be away from home or whatever you are left with a woman uh, who has to look after the next generation and the children if a father dies prematurely like my father did he will leave behind a woman unable to deal with the world and a mother unable to cope or look after his children so therefore we must do whatever we can do to empower women and and in this country i can just tell you uh, the difference between indian and pakistan is very simple we come here our women work with us whereas our counterpart pakistanis they are reluctant to send their wife to work so we have two income two children they have four four children one income doom from the start so therefore today whatever i am i am with the help of my mother, of my wife uh, who worked with me who supported me if i had to look back i could not look forward so my wife went to work she looked after home children and i was able to build an empire which is in 130 country today and receive unprecedented five queens award from the british government by competing with the best in britain that just shows the power of women so therefore i don't want to take too much of your time because i know uh, you already have had very uh, learned uh, 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 guest who have contributed so my request is two thing very simple it doesn't cost a lot of money uh, look after the law enforcement agency and look after women and india will go from strength to strength jai hind thank you so much uh, lord rami ranger his story is something which should inspire a lot of young people he went and he has built uh, an empire industrial empire for himself and at the same time a very eminent member of house of lords and uh, we often say that he is more indian than most indians always concerned about india so thank you very much uh, you have been rich as saying before i offer uh, my concluding remarks and move to q and a session i would like to invite one gentleman uh, shri ashutosh patak he, he is a journalist and he has lived in uh, bihar for 8 to 10 months and he was uh, closely involved in bihar elections so please ashutosh ji you can speak in english or hindi whatever is convenient to you आप लोगों को हमारी आवाज आ रही है बिल्कुल बिल्कुल एक तो आप सबको बहुत बहुत शुभकामना गणतंत्र दिवस की कुरैशी साहब प्रोफेसर अरोड़ा समिता सेन जी और जितेंद्र जी खासतौर से आपको जो आपने ये ऑनलाइन डायलॉग शुरू किया है मैं समझता हूं कि पॉलिटिकल रिफॉर्म के लिए जो सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट टूल अब होने वाला है उसको आपने एक प्रकार से एक प्राइट कर दिया शुरू कर दिया है इसलिए आपको बहुत बहुत शुभकामनाएं इसके लिए बधाई आपको आपने कहा कि मेरे पास वक्त की कमी है लंबे समय से मैं इंतजार भी कर रहा था प्रोफेसर अरोरा की बात को मैं थोड़ा सा आगे बढ़ाना चाहूंगा 
क्योंकि समस्या तो हम सभी जान रहे हैं कि क्या कहा गड़बड़ी है लेकिन कहीं ना कहीं से शुरुआत करनी पड़ेगी मैं समझता हूं कि सिविल सोसाइटी के बारे में जो प्रोफेसर अरोड़ा ने इशारा किया है जो लगभग इस देश में अब खत्म हो गया है उसको रिवाइव करने की आवश्यकता है सिविल सोसाइटी का एक्टिविज्म थोड़ा ट्रांसपेरेंट हो मजबूत हो और वो उसका इंपैक्ट दिखे पहला तो वो मैं चाहूंगा कि उस पर प्रयास करना चाहिए दूसरा जो क्वालिटी ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स है जो क्वालिटी ऑफ लीडरशिप इन पॉलिटिक्स है उसके ऊपर काम करना पड़ेगा फर्ज कीजिए कि इतने अच्छे अच्छे स्पीकर्स हैं अपने एक्सपीरियंस शेयर कर रहे हैं कुरेसी साहब इतनी गहराई से राजनीति को समझ रहे हैं वहां क्या परेशानी है वो भी समझ रहे हैं लेकिन वो राजनीति से दूर हैं ऐसे बहुत सारे जो इन्फॉर्म लोग हैं जिनको कि पब्लिक सर्विस में आना चाहिए वो चाह के भी नहीं आ पा रहे हैं तो ज्वाइनिंग पॉलिटिक्स कैन बी ए मूवमेंट क्योंकि मैं ग्रास रूट पे एज ए जर्नलिस्ट आई हैव बिन कवरिंग मिनी पोलिटिकल पार्टीज तो मैं उनके इनहेरेंट जो प्रॉब्लम्स हैं उसको तो मैं देख ही रहा हूं लेकिन पोस्ट कोरोना और कोरोना काल में जो मैं बिहार में एक इलेक्शन में एक्सपीरियंस किया उसके आधार पर मैं कह सकता हूं कि मैंने हिंदी में बोलना इसलिए उपयुक्त समझा क्योंकि ये जो लैंग्वेज का जो डिविजन है वो दो माइंडसेट को भी दिखलाता है जैसा कि आप कहते हैं कि इंडिया और भारत और मुझे लगता है कि आज भी वही हालात है जैसा गांधी जब पैसेंजर ट्रेन से पूरे देश की यात्रा किए थे आज भी मुझे लगता है कि अगर आप भारत की यात्रा एक पैसेंजर ट्रेन से करें तो आपको 60-70 प्रतिशत आबादी जो मेन स्ट्रीम से बिल्कुल दूर है आपको ताजुब होगा कि मैंने कई ऐसी रिपोर्टें की हैं जिसमें गांव में जाकर के महिलाओं से मैंने पूछा है क्या आप किस चीज के चुनाव में क्या वोट कर रही हैं? उनको कुछ मालूम नहीं विधानसभा का चुनाव है सरपंच का चुनाव है जिला परिषद का चुनाव है लोकसभा का चुनाव है कुछ नहीं गांव की महिलाएं कहती हैं कि रामधनी आएगा और वो हमको बताएगा जिसको वोट करना है उसको दे देंगे और ये लोकल भाषाओं में वहां की जो स्थानीय भाषाएं हैं उसमें वो अपने आप को एक्सप्रेस करती है तो हालात इस स्तर के हैं जो वेस्टर्न डेमोक्रेसी है या अमेरिका या इंग्लैंड उनके पैटर्न पे अगर आप भारतीय डेमोक्रेसी में इलेक्टोरल रिफॉर्म और पॉलिटिकल रिफॉर्म की कल्पना कर रहे हैं तो मैं कई बार चिंतित हो जाता हूं कि शुरू कहां से करूं क्या जुडिशल रिफॉर्म जरूरी है क्या एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव रिफॉर्म जरूरी है इस सबके लिए जरूरी है लिटरेसी का बहुत जोर से होना तो हम ये देखते हैं कि ग्राउंड पे कुछ नहीं है तो आपको लगेगा कि बनाना रिपब्लिक है जैसा आप कुरैशी साहब अभी कह रहे थे कि कॉस्मेटिक रिफॉर्म से अब काम नहीं चलता तो मेरा मानना है कि जो सिविल सोसाइटी की जो भूमिका है उसको आगे बढ़ाया जाए पॉलिटिकल पार्टीज में अच्छे लोग आए इसके लिए मोटिवेट किया जाए क्योंकि लीडर का मतलब होता है टू लीड फ्रॉम द फ्रंट एंड हु विल बी द लीडर लीडर कौन हो सकता है जिसमें वो क्वालिटी हो कुछ तो हो कुछ तो एक्स फैक्टर हो ताकि वो लीड करें अब मैं इसमें इसके अंदर में नहीं जाना चाहता कि हमारे यहां लीडर का चयन किस आधार पर हो रहा है कास्ट के आधार पर हो रहा है डायनेस्टी का आधार पर हो रहा है किस आधार पर हो रहा है ये सबको मालूम है उस चर्चा में जाने की आवश्यकता नहीं है मैं तीसरा फोकस करूंगा कि एक फ्री इंडिपेंडेंट मीडिया की जो भूमिका है एक डेमोक्रेटिक नेशन में वो और उस पर बहुत काम करने की आवश्यकता है हाल के दिनों में हम लोग देख रहे हैं और अनुभव कर रहे हैं अब तो लोग शरेआम कहने लगे हैं कि ये सरकारी मीडिया है ये नॉन सरकारी मीडिया है एकदम से डिविजन हो गया है लेकिन मीडिया की जो असल भूमिका है ट्रांसपेरेंट बैलेंस्ड और फैक्चुअल चीजों को सामने रखना 
जिससे कि समाज पर उसका सही असर हो तो एक फ्री मीडिया का होना बहुत जरूरी है उस दिशा में काम करना है अगर आप पॉलिटिकल रिफॉर्म चाहते हैं क्योंकि मैं नहीं समझता हूं कि पॉलिटिकल रिफॉर्म का मतलब खाली पॉलिटिकल पार्टी के और पॉलिटिकल पार्टी के इलेक्शन लड़ने को लेकर के रिफॉर्म पर चर्चा की जाए उस पर तो कुरैशी साहब ने अपनी बात कही और मेरा चौथा जो सबमिशन होगा वो है इफेक्टिव रूल ऑफ लॉ जो जुडिशरी का इफेक्टिव होना अगर वो नहीं है तो उसमें बहुत दिक्कत है क्योंकि आप देखेंगे कि मैं अभी बिहार में था अजीब अजीब तरह के अनुभव हुए तो आप देखिए मैं तो पहला चाहूंगा कि जैसे इलेक्शन कमीशन है अब इलेक्शन कमीशन अगर आज का आज एक स्टेप ले कि हमें पॉलिटिकल रिफॉर्म चाहिए उनको बाकी काम सब कुछ छोड़ करके पार्टी विच इज इन पावर उनके ऊपर थोड़ी ज्यादा निगाह गड़ा देनी चाहिए क्योंकि अब आपको आश्चर्य होगा कि जो पार्टी पावर में है उसका हारना मुश्किल है अगर वो कोई बहुत बड़ी गलती ना करे क्योंकि उनके पास रिसोर्सेस हैं और उन रिसोर्सेस का इस्तेमाल वो इलेक्टोरल जीत और हार के लिए करते हैं अब प्रधानमंत्री किसी इलाके में जाते हैं और ठीक इलेक्शन के पहले वहां कोई उनका कार्यक्रम होता है वो सरकारी कार्यक्रम होता है लेकिन उस सरकारी कार्यक्रम का इस तरह का इंपैक्ट हो जाता है कि वो लगता है कि वो इलेक्शन का कैंपेन हो और उससे उसकी उनकी पार्टी को फायदा होता है चुनाव में बहुत सारे कॉम्प्लेक्स विषय है तो अगर पॉलिटिकल रिफॉर्म का पहला एजेंडा शुरू किया जाए तो लोग कहते थे ना कि जो राजा होता है उसके खिलाफ कानून सख्त होना चाहिए जो पार्टी सत्ता में है और सत्ता का संस्कार कहां तक हो उसका इंटरवेंशन कहां तक हो पॉलिटिक्स में यह देखना पड़ेगा तो इलेक्शन कमीशन के पास इतने रूल्स हैं जो अगर वो अपने को एस वाई कुरेजी साहब बहुत बढ़िया कह रहे थे जो पॉलिटिकल फंडिंग की बात उन्होंने इशारा किया अरुण जेटली जी की तरफ 1976 से रेट्रोस्पेक्टिव इफेक्ट से आपने ऑडिटिंग नहीं होगा फॉरेन फंडिंग की बिहार का मैं आपको बताना चाहूंगा कि बिहार का नहीं ये पूरे भारत का अनुभव है अब आपको ताजुब होगा कि जब एक कैंपेन की गाड़ी निकल रही थी तो कुछ इलाके से हम लोग गुजर रहे थे तो लोगों लोग कह रहे थे कि आइए बैठिए हमारे साथ आपसे बात करेंगे तो क्या बात करेंगे तो क्या कुछ खर्चा पानी होगा उसके हिसाब से काम करेंगे और ये सबको मालूम है ये कोई नई बात नहीं है जितेंद्र की मेरा ये कहना है कि इलेक्शन हैज बिकम एन इंडस्ट्री इसको अगर खत्म करना है ठीक करना है तो चार चीज जिसके तरफ आप काम कर रहे हैं एक तो इस तरह के ओपिनियन बिल्डिंग्स का काम जो है उसकी शुरुआत हम लोग कर दें और अगर आपने पोस्ट कोरोना में अभी देखिए कि बिहार में क्या हुआ पोस्ट कोरोना में इलेक्टोरल जो कैंपेन हो रहा था वो डिजिटल सरकार तो कर पा रही थी क्योंकि उनके पास रिसोर्सेस थे लेकिन कोई दूसरी पोलिटिकल पार्टी नहीं कर पा रही थी तो ये कहने का मेरा मतलब है कि इस पर बहुत विस्तार से चर्चा हम लोग करेंगे ये चार मुद्दे अगर हम लोग उस पर ध्यान दें सिविल सोसाइटी को आगे बढ़ाना और पॉलिटिकल लीडरशिप के तरफ ज्यादा से ज्यादा लोगों को मोटिवेट करना फ्री मीडिया करना और इफेक्टिव जुडिशरी को करना इससे मेरा ख्याल है कि पॉलिटिकल रिफॉर्म के तरफ हम लोग आगे बढ़ सकते हैं बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद थैंक यू सो मच बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद why did we have a seminar or discussion on a subject like this i believe a lot many years we have been listening uh, from people in the west that this model of governance that evolved in the west in response to their needs of course the nature and pattern of uh, democracy in britain and united states is very different but india has different reality but there is no denial that democracy succeeded in our context because of our values and vision of our leaders but now after 72 years of our republic it is this time that at least intelligentsia people who are having experience and someone so veteran as uh, dr s y kureshi we are so honored to have him and so many other speakers we agitate on these issues we throw up perspective we realize that government is not going to listen or political forces are not going to listen to us regarding all the speakers from dr kalanidhi to professor sen uh, dr professor rora all these people have mentioned one thing that reform in political parties is not going to be a stand alone issue i must quote an anecdote this was more than 10 years back uh, lord uh, 
uh, somebody, some senior colleague of uh, Lord Ranger in uh, his party. There were very few people who held the post of deputy prime minister and they're alive. I happened to speak with them. And in course of uh, this uh, discussion, he suddenly said that it is civil service and judiciary which reigns us in and including media. Because he said, if politicians, if they are left on their own, they will create mayhem. Because we fight to win. We don't fight just to participate in uh, uh, electoral process. That is a very advanced democracy. Dr. Kala also pointed it out about police brutality, etc. So about human beings, we should not be very uh, assured that all people are very good natured. You know, some degree of, uh, one can say, arbitrariness or narcissism or self-love uh, is part of human nature. The moment this democracy it came in, came in quest of a more secure and harmonious societies. People realize that no individual could be repository of soul wisdom. So there has to be some process of participation. But if, uh, as uh, Professor Ora pointed it out, if there are dynasts and dictators and autocrats within political parties and they have captured this machinery, can we expect them to act in a reasonable or rational way? This has been spoken far too many times. So the counterbalances that you talked about. So these counterbalances could be what? Rule of law, of course, one thing. But how can we expect in our country where 20 years, 30 years it takes uh, to get decision on subject and sometimes we say that justice has become a cold plated justice that you literally need to have a lot of resources to get justice and you'll be lucky if you get one. So increasingly political process or electoral process has become a game between political parties where space for genuine space for comprehensive advancement of the country is getting uh, marginalized. Why somebody like me who's studying geopolitics and national security strategy should be concerned because all the time we have been saying we are living in a difficult geopolitics, we are facing it. And let me tell you, I'm not sure how many people are aware that welfare state, we have always believed, someone like me, welfare state is a very critical ingredient of national security. The, at the base of the pyramid, when you are trying to formulate a national security strategy, at the base of the pyramid, we say health of population, health of population, education level of population, it is very cru uh, crucial. In 19th century Europe also, I'm not trying to quote only Europe, but yes, we have to say when wars became, uh, we had a phenomenon of uh, mass warfare, it is generals who started pushing their governments that you have to pay attention to health of people and health of women also. And subsequently, now we realize that uh, national security is not only war making, you have to be strong enough to sustain your capacity to manage internal conflicts or external conflicts, etc. So this is not a charity, which is which has to be done to people. Because moment major societies, major states have faced difficulties, it is elite of those societies also who have paid a heavy price. So political parties, why we are saying political parties are expected to act as aggregators of collective aspirations of the people as well as their interests. There are conflicting agendas could be there. There's no doubt about it. But they are someone who are real role models. So they are supposed to lead everyone, aggregate everyone, but it is wrong to blame them as Dr. Kala pointed it out. They have a difficult time. It is very critical that they are provided right ecosystem where they can throw up these ideas. So we realize that by having these debates, we cannot change much, but it is very important to have these debates. This is not the first one. This will be in a series of debates. We are going to take up issues like uh, law and order criminal justice system. We are going to take up, we are going to invite uh, you know, judges from India, and judges from uh, other courts also, other, other countries as well. We are going to invite police officers. We are going to invite, we are talking about reform in corporate sector. Because whenever I speak with uh, some of the corporate leaders, I had chance to speak with them. Some of them, they invited me when I was working. And I said, sorry, I cannot work with you. And when I sp spoke with them that you are also a representative of India, why are you doing something like this? And he has to say, well, you know, I have to bear burden of political class and these, these things we have to do. I, I hope I'm not disclosing any state uh, secret as such, uh, uh, but I have to, I must share this thing because I'm not disclosing identity of the person. They were not hearsay, a very legally valid documents of uh, money laundering by a senior politician. Now this money laundering is a very sophisticated business. So this, this is a very documented, this gentleman has said that somebody had invested money from this, this thing, uh, this, this uh, company, and I happened to get through proper channel some documents which uh, showed that the so-called investor never had that much of money in his account. And this was fraud. So logically he should have gone to jail and a very influential person. This is not one case, multiple cases. So imagine, and that person is very powerful. So what I'm trying to say, and nothing happened after that, you know, he was able to go scot-free. Secondly, I must say another example. 
there was the one uh, global uh, top uh, one of the banks and he this gentleman was uh, in top 3 again i'm uh, i would prefer out of courtesy not to disclose his identity and i knew that how many how much money of indian politicians and corporate leaders etc was parked in his bank and i told him that do you know that 40 to 50% of our children are having stunted growth this is the problem and all this money is stolen money and how much impact it can have and his and he had some kind of indian ancestry he became defensive he started saying yes i understand that some of the banks are not having good strategy but they are in business they are doing this 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 he was personally very defensive and what he said that you know the people who are parking this money they are coming out with these these excuses that you know they are being persecuted they are this thing and that's why they have to park this money but let me tell you mr kumar that moment uh, you, your government uh, gives us one instruction that they have to disclose we will disclose it we don't want to keep keep an ill gotten money or money of gap but he said but in, in last two years till uh, last two hours i can assure you that no request has come from your government we understand that there will be pressures we we realize that uh, Uh, this problem cannot be solved through law alone but what are its consequences its consequences are devastating when we are talking about national security we are having one country which is uh, observing an opaque system of governance and that country has managed to forge ahead and that is constantly mocking us that we are an inferior civilization i have also been saying that you know we never had strategic uh, vision the kind of strategic vision we require today we are we very proudly talk about our past that we were certainly the oldest civilization but certainly we have certain wrong things as well of course geopolitical management diplomacy etc can play a role but there is absolutely nothing which can substitute healthy institutions and for healthy institutions political class certainly has to play a role but if entire this political platforms are being hijacked what happens when i talked about earlier also that uh, this kind of activities of these any politician or any indian elite this is not going to be secret this is going to be known by external forces if this uh, uh, this place is not transparent if there are this kind of uh, underhand funding this kind of underhand control will it not impact our sovereignty will it not impact long term interests and security of our people and we have been shying away because overwhelming majority of people in indian elite i would say they have a lot to hide we realize that coercive action cannot be a solution but getting down to few issues that we have noted it down and we felt that what should be done of course dr kala gave lot of ideas all the eminent speakers gave lot of ideas we are very inspired by dr kureshi's observations we will say that uh, entry and induction we need even politicians to be uh, to be skilled in their job britain was a different country we know that britain was a colonial power they acquired lot of prosperity and after that they started uh, uh, opening up it was only during around second world war that they became uh, they ushered in welfare state or something like this america slave owners and person who opposed slave ownership had to be he was killed eventually abraham lincoln and we see how much uh, uh, even in this uh, recent uh, crisis there are a lot of allegations uh, of uh, racism that how people have been treating uh, people of uh, different races uh, black people for for that matter so racism is a reality it's not that these democracies are perfect we have been believing this all these days or even in south asia we have been saying islamic radicalism is there other day we had seminar and former chief of rnw he said that how one particular assistant secretary of state was always referring to islamic terrorists till 911 as freedom fighters and then their perception changed so we are living in a world where nobody is our permanent friends and for elite also it is very important that they look pay attention to comprehensive national security of india this is not a solution that people will go away with these words i we know that there cannot be a quick fix solution this is the purpose that we will agitate we know that nothing is going to happen in one day but this process will continue before yeah we can hear you yeah no uh, actually uh, this aspect uh, it was uh, uh, professor um, uh, samita sen who dealt with this question uh, more in detail but i i was impressed with uh, her observations and i i'll try to answer this she she made a very valid point about dynasties and caste and inheritance uh, that a lot of things are inherited 
inheritance is considered perfectly normal in business. After all, nobody questions when the son of a businessman takes over his father's business. So, as long as it is inherited wealth, it's all right. If it is inherited uh, profession, globally, the professions which are uh, passed on from generation to generation, lawyers, you know the names of the their firms uh, and, and how they uh, uh, tell you how many generations have been there. Doctors, public servants, film actors, she mentioned. Inheritance of occupation. Now, when inheritance uh, is considered legitimate among the professions which are by and large closed to the lower castes and open to the upper castes, then this question of positive discrimination or affirmative action is basically intended to break free and to open, to democratize the professions. Now, I, I, from what I have understood of the question, and let me look at it again, I saw it. Uh, it is that, is it causing more discrimination? Isn't reservation for the sake of eliminating discrimination causing more discrimination in society? I think it's Yukta Acharya uh, who asked this. The fact is that if you look at the statistics, uh, what is reserved, uh, the reserved seats in any university, in any profession, they are by and large, the quota is not filled. They are uh, only a few who manage and the argument that is very often given is that there is an inheritance of affirmative action, which the same families will uh, continue to benefit from the reservation. So uh, I would submit to Yukta Acharya that it will take a long time because we are only 71 or 72 years old as a republic. It will take a long time for us to reach a, a stage where we can say that notionally the constitution said 10 years was the period for reservation. But uh, it has uh, been extended and I think it's not just economic deprivation, it is also social deprivation. So we have to remain sensitive to this problem and understand that uh, we are not in a position to say, just as, I mean, look at the United States. The Black Lives Matter movement and the fact, and, and they have a much bigger history, a longer history. So we have a, a, some distance to cover before we can say uh, with Yukta Acharya that it is adding to the problem. For the moment, it is, I think, trying to address a problem that is unresolved. Very privileged to have uh, Lord Ranger. I also wanted this uh, uh, panel to be all inclusive, as wide as possible, representing various sections. So Ashutosh also added to our diversity. Uh, before I conclude uh, and invite to Soham, I will say two, three sentences that this is uh, an idea we are seeking or attempting to do something which nobody has done. I had never heard of reforms, the idea of reforms in political parties. We realize that uh, this is crucial. We cannot afford to rely on British, American or Japanese or any other model. Yet it is need for especially stakeholders of India to think of some newer ways and not only uh, with regard to political parties, but also with regard to criminal justice system, also with regard to corporate uh, sector, also with regard to media, also with regard to our civil service, because ultimately advancement of societies happen because people learn to compete with each other on fair terms and yet uh, in a more humanized way, collaborate with each other. So democracy came as an effective tool. 
but we have to refine it we always say that uh, uh, democracy has longer roots in india i suppose that uh, it is as much responsibility of indian intelligence indian india strategic community to digitate on these issues and the extent to which they can influence political class extent to which not only political class i would say also corporate leaders or stakeholders of india in different uh, spheres because it is not a charity it is not something which concerns any individual it concerns destiny and plight of this country at the same time destiny of this country is very critical for larger defense of freedom globally with these words i know that uh, and at best we will succeed in igniting few ideas and this will continue with these words i thank a very esteemed panelist and request uh, director of the foundation mr soham das to propose a vote of thanks and uh, one last sentence uh, uh, lord R ranger he came at a very short notice and he offered his perspective we would have loved to understand british uh, political system and party system we will continue to do that we had a very interesting and fascinating discussion fascinating discussion at this conference uh, let me on behalf of tilakma foundation thank all the distinguished speakers and the eminent guests at this conference i must specially thank dr s y qureshi for delivering the keynote address at this conference let me also thank professor samita sen professor balveer arora dr kalani di viraswami for being with us here today and sharing their wisdom i thank lord rami ranger member of the house of lords for sharing his views with us it is a great pleasure to have you among us I express my special appreciation for Mr. Jitendra Kumar Roja, distinguished fellow, Tiruttama Foundation, for his contribution to this conference. I thank all those who contributed in making this conference a success. Thank you. <laughs>